Well, for some reason, you've all gone quiet, so I, I, I guess we might as well start. Good morning. A really warm welcome. The silence is not normal. Uh, if you're with us for the first time, uh, welcome. My name's Peter. I'm the minister here, if we've not yet met. And um, if you are new with us, um, we'd, we'd love you to stick around at the end for a, for a coffee. Um, you can also pick up a welcome pack. You'll find those in the ends of the rows. And um, you can connect with us online as well if you'd like to do that. There's various QR codes you can scan in your uh, order of service as well. Um, I'll give uh, more announcements later in the service. You'll meet various members of our church family as well who come to uh, lead us in prayer and uh, read the Bible for us uh, and so on. Uh, but we do come to, to worship God as he deserves. Uh, we come to bring him our prayers as he invites us. And we come to hear from his word, the Bible. We believe that God speaks to us in his word. And so as we prepare our hearts to do all of that, let's pray together. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we praise you that you are present with us by your spirit. Speak to us today, we pray, by your word. Inspire us to worship. Help us to bring our prayers to you. And Lord, we pray that all we say and do together would be for our good, for the spread of the gospel, and for the glory of the name of Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen. Well, we're having a little bit of a harvest theme this morning, especially with our children uh, in just a moment. And so here are some words from Psalm 65 to call us to worship. They say this of the Lord. You crown the year with your bounty, and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks, and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. And we're going to respond to our good God who provides abundantly in the words of this song. This song, give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. So if you're able, let's stand as we sing together. Thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm,
it. And uh, it is great to have the boys and girls with us. In a few minutes, you're going to head out to your Sunday school groups. Uh, but it is that time of year when we think about God's provision for us. And uh, I stay at Resile now, and the, the fields there, as you're about to see, have been uh, all harvested. The barley's been brought in. And we think of how God, not just the farmers, but how God provides for us. And uh, this week we had, um, I don't know, 120 kids from the school, plus lots of parents across for our end of term harvest assembly. And uh, we're going to give you a flavor just now of what we did with them. And we're going to start by meeting a couple of interesting characters. Well, hello there, boys and girls. <laughs> My name is Farmer Joe. But of course, some of you knows that, don't you? I remember I met some of you lot, maybe primary five, six, and seven, the other day, like, at our harvest experience, didn't I? <laughs> busy day for us farmers, though. Busy time of year. I've been very busy, as you can see, with my combine harvester, bringing in all the barley and that. That's what I do, you know. I'm an arable farmer, so I just crops and that. Like barley and, let's see now, potatoes, carrots, that sort of thing. <laughs> oh, but I got a friend. His name is Farmer Jock. And he does the other a lot, like, you know, like, um, like, um, like, um, you know, like animals. Like cows and sheep and all that. Oh, come and think of it. Would you like to meet him? Come with me, I'll show you my friend Farmer Jock, who does all the animals. Hello again, boys and girls. Here's my friend Farmer Jock. Hello, Farmer Jock. I, I see you're with the sheep. Oh, they're lovely, and they? All lovely and fluffy and cute and that. Hey, well, hello there, Farmer Joe. I, I, I can see that you didn't ken anything about sheep. These sheep are, are stinky and filthy, and dirty. And worst of all, boys and girls, they never do what you tell them. Oh, I didn't realize that, Farmer Jock. I always thought they was lovely and fluffy and cute in that. I, I didn't realize they could be so rebellious. <laughs> oh, oh, hey, Farmer Joe, she, sheep are very difficult to lead. They need a really good shepherd, like me. <laughs> I mean, you see, Farmer Joe, uh, sheep, they wouldn't have just follow anyone. They wouldn't have follow you, for example, because they didn't ken your voice, but me. Oh, they'd follow me, because I'm their shepherd. A pretty good shepherd as well. Did I mention that, boys and girls? <laughs> They'll listen to me, oh I <laughs> Well, at least sometimes. Oh, well, that is interesting, Farmer Jock. Oh, I didn't know that. I oh, always thought they were lovely and fluffy and stuff. I oh, didn't realize they could be so rebellious. I'd love to go and get a closer look, though, wouldn't you, boys and girls? Shall we go in? Let's just climb over the fence here. Oh, hang on a minute. It's a bit sharp. Barbed wire fence and all that. Farmer Joe, listen. Sometimes I worry about you climbing over a barbed wire fence. Nay, nay, nay. If you're going to enter the pasture, you've got to go in through the gate. Oh, oh, right. I see. you got to go in through the gate. Oh, well... My mother did always say I was a few potatoes short of a casserole. A couple of very strange characters there, weren't they, boys and girls? Well, did you mention, you might have thought that was just a bit of fun, but did you listen to what Farmer Jock was telling Farmer Joe about the sheep? He said a few things, didn't he? He said, if you want your sheep to follow you, you need to be a good shepherd, and the sheep need to know your voice. 
And he said, if you're going to go into the sheepfold, you've got to go in through the gate. Now, I've got some props here. Three things for us to remember this morning and three props. First of all, once again, thanks to Liz McNogata for her gate. Hope the dog doesn't escape, Liz. Here's the first one. Now, what would you use a gate for, boys and girls? Not a trick question. What would you use it for? Fiona, you seem quite keen. To go in, that's right. At the assembly the other day, they, all they could say was it keeps people shut in. But no, that's not the point. I suppose it would keep you, you shut in, wouldn't it, if you were going to escape. But the point is that you've got to go in through a gate if you want to... You don't go through the barbed wire, do you? That's right. And there's something Jesus said. Can you see on the screen? Jesus said, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. And the point is this. If we want to come in and be part of God's people, Jesus is the way in. Jesus is the way to know God. Jesus is the way to belong to his people. Okay. Next, here's something else Jesus said. He said, I am the good shepherd. And uh, I've also got uh, another prop here. Who can tell me? Watch this. And uh, let me give you a clue. I am not old enough to need a walking stick. So it's not that. What is it? Does anyone know? Anybody know? Alex? A shepherd's crook. It is a shepherd's crook. So if you're a shepherd, you've got to keep the sheep in order because as we discovered, they can be very unruly. So you might even give them a bit of a whack now and then, but you'll guide them in the right way with your shepherd's crook. And Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. So boys and girls, Jesus is not just the way in to know God. If we want to be guided the right way in life to know what to do and where to go, Jesus is the shepherd we need. But he didn't just say that, did he? Look, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So Jesus is such a good shepherd, he's even willing to give his life for the sheep. Now, here's a sheep, not a live specimen. Now, you'll be pleased to know. But in the Old Testament, boys and girls, you know that there were lots of sacrifices, animal sacrifices, including lambs at the temple. And they were like a big signpost that told us that we can't just come in through the gate and be friends with God. Our sin keeps us out. And sin has to be paid for because God is just. But Jesus came not just to be a gate, not just to be a good shepherd, but actually to be like a lamb who gave his life as a sacrifice for sin so our sins could be forgiven. And we could come in through the gate and know God as our friend and king. And so I'm sure lots of you know this verse already, but I thought we would learn this verse together. And we're going to do it with a bit of British sign language. Because I know that some of you do that at school. So can you copy me and we'll learn this together. Some of you got a head start on Friday. So here's what we do. We do this. I am the good shepherd. So you're making a sign of the shepherd's crook, okay? Once again, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You can imagine why that's a sheep, can't you? Should we do it again together? Here we go. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Fantastic. One last time. A bit faster. Here we go. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Well done. Fantastic. The kids are going to head out in just a minute to their Sunday school group. And we're really grateful to our Sunday school leaders. But just before you go, let me pray for our time together. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you that Jesus is the good shepherd and the way in to know you because he's laid down his life for us, the sheep. And so, Lord, we pray, whatever our age, whether we learn in here, whether we learn through in Sunday school, that all people of all ages today would learn what it is to follow Jesus as our good shepherd. And we pray in his name. Amen. Fantastic. Well, they're going to head down to the hall now, the kids, so our Sunday school leaders will, uh, will lead them out. So on they go.
Well, I'm going to take a moment just to give some uh, announcements as well, share a bit of uh, church family news. Um, you've got a, a church family news sheet. As I always say, please uh, take that away. Please read it. I am not going to mention everything. You'll be pleased to know there wouldn't be time. Uh, but let me just highlight from uh, that sheet that uh, this week is a, a bit of a quieter week. Um, it's holiday time. You can see that this morning. A lot of our own folks are away uh, on holiday. Um, so we've got no uh, Wednesday prayer cafe this, uh, this week. That'll take a break uh, for the October holidays. Um, and, uh, but we'll be back to small groups the following week. Uh, so uh, that's, that's in terms of what's happening. You can see the other things uh, there as well. Um, you'll see as well a little update there about our um, Building for the Future uh, project. Um, this is the, uh, the extension and renovation of our church halls, which is where uh, the children have just gone. Uh, I want to say two things today. The first is uh, thank you to all those who've, who've given. We asked folk to respond by the end of September and I think most people have done that. Um, just to share the good news that um, we are at over £180,000 uh, given, which is extraordinary uh, in a few weeks. Uh, and that's really, there's one or two external donations, but really that is, that is mainly just our own church family. Um, so thank you for all you've given. If you still want to respond and haven't, it's not too late. Um, so please do that. But here's the second thought. We're moving into another phase of fundraising now. And um, I wonder if I can set you a challenge. Uh, is there some fundraising event or sponsored challenge uh, that you or a group of folks uh, would like to uh, think of, propose, and, and take on? A couple of examples. There's a couple of ladies who've organized a, a craft fair. They've made a bunch of crafts. Um, they're going to sell those. They've organized a whole day of, uh, of that, and the proceeds will go to um, uh, the Hall Fund. Um, I was chatting with Rachel this week. We've got a plan. We're going to involve some others uh, of the runners in the congregation. I include myself in that category only very loosely, um, but we're going to set a, a big mileage target and try and run it together between us in a month and uh, do a sponsored thing that way. So it's a kind of different phase of fundraising. Have a think. Is there something you could do, some crazy challenge um, that could go towards that fund? Uh, next, just to say um, it's been a really encouraging couple of weeks in that we've, we've welcomed 10 new members um, uh, into our church family uh, over the last couple of weeks. And um, I'm going to be really horrible and ask if they would all stand up because I'd like to see you all, and everyone else would as well. So if that's you, please stand up. Paul and Esther, Francis and Heather, Kirsty, Ruth, Douglas, Erin, Kaylin, and Rachel. There we go. Praise the Lord. Welcome. Please do have a seat. <laughs> They're thinking he didn't tell me they were going to do that. That wasn't in the contract. Uh, anyway, welcome. It's really encouraging uh, to have new members with us. Uh, and then finally, um, we're going to have uh, a mission partner update um, our, our four small groups are all linked up with uh, different mission partners um, uh, around the world. And today we're going to hear from Davi's group, but not from Davi, I think from Keith. There he is. I was feeling fearful when I couldn't see you, Keith. Uh, uh, an update on the persecuted church uh, with which the group is linked. So thanks, Keith. Over to you. Well, good morning. Um, most, as Peter said, most of the small groups have an individual or a family they support. We've been given the persecuted church. So where do you start? Uh, well, the persecuted church uh, covers these days even more, a wider area, well beyond the boundaries of what we used to call the 1040 window. I haven't got time to explain that. Older folk may remember that. But, so where do we start? Well, I'm going to start with the Second World War. Uh, after the war, the USSR, now known as Russia, but the USSR closed its borders, put up an iron curtain, nobody was allowed in or out, and we didn't know what was going on, or the West didn't know what was going on, only that there was this arms race. Well, what we did find out, what filtered out, is that Christians were being persecuted, imprisoned, sent to the gulags, um, churches closed, and Bibles were banned. And in 1955, uh, a man, I wonder if anybody will remember, uh, if I were to say a certain Mr. Van der Beegel. Anybody know? Does that ring a bell with anybody? I knew you'd answer. <laughs> the, the 
Sorry? I'm sure I did. I don't speak Dutch. His Dutch name is Anna van der Well, I know it's Anna in some places. Well, we know him as Brother Andrew, okay? And otherwise known as God's smuggler. And he, he heard that Christians in the, behind the Iron Curtain needed Bibles. So he decided that it would be a good idea to try and smuggle some in. A uh, very dangerous operation, but he started in 1955. Somebody gave him a, a, a Volkswagen Beetle, and he smuggled, he hid these Bibles in the, uh, uh, in the car, in different places in the car. And so far as I understand, he was never discovered. And he traveled thousands of miles with these Bibles, distributing them to a network of Christians behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, in fact, somebody looked at that car once and said, how is this car still going? But he, he, it did. And uh, the organization which he, um, uh, which he founded is called Open Doors. And the sad news from Open Doors is that uh, Brother Andrew has just died at the age of 94. Now, that's obviously something quite sad, but it's also we can be thankful for his life and for his witness and for his work in helping Christians uh, behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, as, um, as the things relaxed, he was able to turn his attention to, um, to other places where he also worked. But um, open, he may have gone, but the work of <coughs> Open Doors continues. And one of the things uh, they, they do is to produce a um, world watch list of the 50 most dangerous places it is to be a Christian. Now, on the mission board at the back, I've got the map and a list of the 50 countries. It would be better if you, if you read that by, any, by all means, but if you, it would be better if you go to the internet, find um, Open Doors World Watch List 2022, because the map on there is interactive. You can click on different um, countries and it'll give you, bring up a window which tells you a little bit about that country. Uh, another organisation which uh, helps or monitors persecution throughout the world is Release International. Again, they have a website. And if you follow them on Facebook, very easy to find, uh, you can get latest updates if you follow them. You know, you register and you follow them. And they will give you uh, up regular updates. They don't bombard you, but there are regular updates. And one of the bad news is that they uh, recently published is a, regarding a country that they often post about, which is Nigeria. Now, Nigeria is number seven on the um, Open Doors uh, watch list. But the, the people who are causing mayhem in the northern part of the country are the Faluji. Fula, sorry, the Fulani herdsmen, um, Islamist uh, fanatics, and they seem to rampage at will through the country, uh, attacking Christian communities, burning churches, kidnapping people, uh, murdering people, and there has been a recent, in September, there was a, another outrage caused, and the Nigerian government seem incapable or unwilling to do anything about it. So... Please go to those websites, Open Doors and Release International, and you can find out uh, more about that. It's more than I've got time to tell you. But going briefly back to Brother Andrew, however you pronounce his real name, uh, there are two books published. This, this is the original 1960s version, uh, which um, some of you of my vintage uh, will remember. Very popular uh, round about the time I became a Christian. And um, uh, there's another, an, uh, a, a more updated, enlarged version published in 2015, which is uh, the 60th anniversary of when he started in, two, in 1955. I will leave these on the back by the mission board. Please, there's plenty of information there about uh, Release International. They don't just do the Nigerian. There's... A, a, um, uh, a trending list of all sorts of different countries throughout the world. But I will leave these at the back. Please borrow them. Uh, please bring them back. I uh, don't mind how long you keep them. Or how, when I'd like them back eventually. <laughs> but there's no hurry. Just borrow them, read them, and bring it back so somebody else can do it, can have them. Okay, thank you.
Thanks so much, Keith. Please make the most of those resources. We're going to hand over to Paul now to lead us in our press. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> well, we're going to pray together, so let's bow our heads. First time ever my technology is uh, doing what technology is supposed to do, playing up, but let's go. Lord, forever you're strong, forever you're with us. We praise you now for your everlasting faithfulness and enduring love. We sang that you're good above all things. We rejoice that we've been reborn, that by the grace of God we will carry on, sustained by our remembrance of how you have kept your promises across all history. And maybe, Lord, that's sometimes how we live our lives, but yet, Lord, we acknowledge and repent of the weakness of our own faithfulness, our own sense of your purpose in our lives. From the very beginning of creation, men and women have sought their own way. We've turned our backs on you, ignoring your commands and rejecting your love. Even now, as we pray, it's so easy for our minds to wander, to wander off to our earthly preoccupations. And so we want to focus on Jesus right now. Jesus, the source of all that is good, all that is holy. We thank and praise you for Jesus your gift for a broken world who demonstrated your unfailing love, the one who died for us to clear a path for us back to you, who rose from the grave to show his dominion over death. And yet our love remains shallow. And Lord, we cry to you for mercy and forgiveness for our lack of faith. And we're both shamed and encouraged by our Christian brothers and sisters throughout the world. Some we've just heard about this morning, suffering persecution beyond our imagining. But followers who know your mighty and outstretched arm, who by your grace will carry on seeking and serving. Who in the words of the Apostle Paul are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. Thank you, Lord, for their example. Lord, we ask for justice and a righting of wrongs wherever your word and your people are suffering. Lord God, we, we pray for our small church here in Burghead. We're so grateful for our new members May they be an encouragement to us all and may we be a source of your love and encouragement for their growth in following Jesus. Would each one of them find this church a place of strength and fellowship and your word preached here a source of their eternal security and peace. We pray for your plans, Lord, to bring others into the kingdom, plans we interpret and try to understand and implement for your glory. For our refurbishment plans and our linkage plans, we ask for your blessing on each part. For your guidance, your wisdom, your encouragement, your, um, your protection. We pray for Brian and Cheryl in St. Louis. Thank you for your spirit working in them, giving them courage and perseverance. Give them strength and wisdom, we pray, in these next six months especially, to face the slings and arrows or as the Bible puts it, to face the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We thank you for answered prayer to this point, and may they and we never take your grace towards us for granted. And we pray for Peter and for our elders as they grapple with needs and circumstances, with, well, with fears and hopes, with encouragements and disappointments, which sometimes seem to be in unequal measure. 
especially we pray for the burdens you've laid on Peter. We, we ask you to give him the energy he needs, but also the awareness of when to ease back a little to protect his own well-being. Lord, only you know the balance he must find. Guide him and guard him and his family, we pray. And finally, Lord, as always, we pray for this small body of believers here this morning, for those who are walking determinedly in your steps. We thank and praise you, Lord, for them. May they continue to grow in love. For those who may be faltering in their walk, not sure of the path they're on, speak to them this morning, Lord. Shine a light on the way for them. Leave them in no doubt of your goodness toward them. And let them know afresh the blessings of your welcome into your family. And if there are some this morning, Lord, who don't know you at all, maybe they're searching. Maybe they've never looked seriously for the treasure you offer. Lord, we're so grateful they're here. And we ask that you would surprise them. That you would speak in such a way that they know the truth and accept it into their hearts. Bring them close to our Savior and Comforter, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, before we, uh, we sing again, we're going to be singing in just a moment from Psalm uh, 57, but we're going to say together the Apostles' Creed, which is on the sheet and uh, on the screen before you. So uh, let's say together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Paul for leading us in prayer and as we confess our faith together. We're going to sing uh, just uh, now again from Psalm 57. My heart is steadfast, Lord. Shall we stand as we sing? My heart is steadfast, Lord, with music I will sing. sit we're continuing our series today in the book of Isaiah and uh, here comes Gillian she's going to read for us uh, from Isaiah chapter 58 Thanks, Jane. Good 
and it's on page 746 in the Church Bibles. <clears throat> Shout it out loud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways. As if there were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet, on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble, humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed? and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood, then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame you will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will build the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called the repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on, the whole, on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father, Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Thank you, Gillian, for reading for us. Let's pray as we come to consider these words. Our Father, we pray that you would shine the light of your word into the darkness of our lives and the waywardness of our hearts, that we might know your grace and your leading. In Jesus' name. Well, it has been um, really great to welcome so many new members into our congregation, 10, as I said, in the last couple of weeks. And um, as elders, it's always so encouraging to get to chat with folks and to hear their stories of how they came to saving faith in the Lord Jesus. But one conversation I had about church membership last week was not encouraging. 
In fact, it was quite depressing. This person explained to me that as a child, one of the things that had driven her away from the church and given her no desire to be a member was the hypocrisy of church members. They were there each Sunday, dressed, no doubt, in their Sunday best. Christian people, apparently. Upstanding members of the community, allegedly. The trouble was, as far as she could see, their lives, the other six days of the week, seemed to bear little resemblance to their Sunday professions of faith. It seemed to her, at least, that their Christian faith was more lip service than lifestyle, more religious profession, which didn't match real life practice. And that was really damaging. It was damaging for this woman who felt repelled away from Jesus, damaging for the cause of Christ, damaging for the reputation of the church, but even more than that, as we'll see today in Isaiah, damaging for those religious hypocrites themselves. It puts them in real danger. And it shows that whatever they might profess with their mouths, if their life shows no resemblance, they cannot really have trusted Christ, the suffering servant, in their hearts. Whatever their church membership certificate might say. Well, keep that in mind because today we are picking up again in the book of Isaiah. Um, remember, by the way, that, that, that this year in 2022, we will have had a whistle-stop tour of the whole book in about 20 sermons. Um, now, these talks have been spread some across the morning, some across our evening service. They've also had some gaps between them. Uh, so let's just take a moment to get our heads back into this book. Remember, Isaiah has been commissioned by God to be a prophet but he's been told that the warnings he'll bring to the people about God will actually go largely unheeded. The people around him are, in the words of Isaiah himself, a people of unclean lips. Although God has given them his word and a promised land to live in, they have not listened to him, they will not obey him. And despite a multitude of warnings that that wandering from God meant foregoing the blessing and bringing his judgment, still they haven't listened. And instead of trusting God for his perfect provision and protection, instead they've made alliances with the pagan world around them, which has both betrayed their lack of trust in the Lord, and perhaps even worse, has led them further away from God as they've copied the idolatrous practices of their neighbors. The crunch point comes in the middle of the book when it becomes clear that they've gone too far and judgment's going to come. The people are carried away into exile, away from the promised land. And in one sense, it's as if God has just given them the consequences that they themselves have chosen. You want to make alliances with other nations? Well, then God gives them over to the mercy of those other nations. Turns out the Babylonians don't show much mercy and they sweep in, they ransack Judah and they carry most at least of the people off as slaves. But then in this second half of the book we, we see the words of Isaiah come prophetically forward in time to a new generation, the generation who are now in exile and they get these words of promise and comfort and hope. Turns out that God, in his amazing patience and in his faithfulness to the promises he's made, has not forgotten the people, has not abandoned the people. He will bring them hope. He will bring them home. And more than that, despite the fact that Israel have failed in their task of being God's servant... God himself will send a new servant who will obey the Lord, who will bring in a new age of righteousness. And this servant will achieve all of that in the most surprising way, by suffering. 
More on that story later. For now, the focus is back on God's people, the nation of Israel. And today's passage shows us two things about them. Firstly, it's a reminder why another servant is needed. It's a reminder of their failure and their repeated failure. But secondly, it's, it's a warning to them and to us. It's a warning that if God's servant hasn't changed our lifestyle, he certainly hasn't changed our eternal destiny either. If God's servant hasn't changed our lifestyle, he hasn't changed our destiny. Let's get into it. Here's the first point. There are three points on your sheet. As always, space to take notes if you want to. Here's number one. Beware the danger of false religion. Let's read again from verse one. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Translation, here's an important message which needs to be broadcast loud and clear. So clean out your lugs, listen up, don't miss this. And what do we need not to miss? Well, read on. Sadly, we need to hear about the rebellion of God's people. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. And so yet again, it's depressing, isn't it? Once again, we hear that Israel, who have been so blessed by God are still not listening, still not obeying. But it's more precise than that. There's a particular kind of rebellion in mind. You see, as you looked at this people, on the face of it, they probably wouldn't have looked like rebels against the Lord. They actually might have looked pretty religious. Look at verse 2, for example. Day after day, they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions. They seem eager for God to come near them. And verse 3 makes clear that they've been doing this, they've been humbling themselves by fasting before God. The middle of verse 5, look in your Bible, they've been wearing sackcloth and ashes which often accompanied fasting and, and was a sign of, of mourning, of sin and, and repentance. In other words, these people look pretty good. There's lots of religious externals, if I can put it that way. Plenty of churchy activity. They attended the Bible study and the prayer meeting. They'd have been there all day for the National Day of Prayer. They, they'd even have fasted as part of it. In other words, crucially, here are a people who might have looked very much like us. And you might think God would have praise for them. You know, pat them on the back for all this religious activity, but he does not. Quite the opposite. See, although they seem eager to know God, end of verse 2, that desire is actually just skin deep. Although they seem eager to know the Lord's ways, their living, their lifestyle betrays the fact that they're actually not at all serious about knowing God. In other words, they are a bunch of religious hypocrites. And perhaps even worse, they are the sort of religious hypocrites who treat God as if he were a divine slot machine. Do you see verse 3? Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you have not noticed? It's as if they're saying to God, look, we did our bit. You know, we fasted a bit. We prayed, maybe. You know, we did, we did our religious stuff, you know. We, we did the religious ceremony that you asked for, God. We did our bit, but what about you, God? You didn't do your bit. You didn't seem to notice our fast. You didn't seem to listen to our prayers. We did our religious bit, but you didn't do your blessing bit. It's your fault, God. The divine slot machine is faulty. And in response to that arrogance, God brings them a few home truths. You see, in one way, they're actually right. God has ignored their religious activity. He hasn't been willing to heed their fasting or listen to their prayers. Why? Because their fasting is 
a sham. Because their religious ceremonies are just that, no more than perfunctory performances. Read on, middle of verse 3. Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please. You exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I've chosen only for a day people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed or for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the laws? See, they want God's blessing, but they're not really concerned with God himself. And the way you can tell that is that they're not concerned with God's ways. They're not concerned with God's commands. God is concerned for the unity of his people, but they just want conflict and strife, which most likely comes from their selfishness. That's verse 3. God is concerned, have a look at verse 6, for justice. He's the God of all justice. But the people are happy instead to, to enslave and exploit others. God is concerned, look at verse 7, for the hungry, that people will share their food. God is concerned for the wanderer, the naked, in other words, that the poor, the dispossessed, the refugee, but the people have no regard for these. And yet they expect God to be at their beck and call in prayer. God is concerned, again, end of verse 7, for family. It's not just wanderers or foreigners or refugees to whom we have a responsibility, but our own families as well. But these people seem to have little regard even for their own flesh and blood. And yet they're happy to treat God like a slot machine. They, they put in some casual religious observance and expect to get blessing back. Just as an aside, you do sometimes come across a similar, although not exactly the same, type of religious slot machinery, if I can put it that way. Have you come across this? Usually on TV, usually from America, although not always. These are the health and wealth preachers who say, just sow your seed, just give us your money. Just a hundred quid, just a thousand quid. And God will bless you back. Treat God like a divine slot machine is essentially what they're saying. Do you see how dangerous this attitude is? And yet even as we do that, it's easy, isn't it, to see this, this problem in other people. But God always calls us to look in here, not just out there. So what about us? Is our devotion to God just casual? Is it a kind of do the basics and accept the blessing? Is it lip service only? In my 15 years in Christian ministry, I have met too many folk to count who came to church sporadically, didn't belong to a small group, didn't gather to pray, rarely read their Bible, and then complained when God seemed distant. Little casual religious observance and nothing more. But though, as this passage shows, it's actually possible to, to do much more than that, to tick all the religious boxes. You know, even if you do come here every Sunday, morning and evening, and even if you do go to the prayer meeting and the small group Bible study and do your religious duty, but if none of it touches your heart and you remain unchanged, sometimes people still do get shirty with God when he feels distant. Or it appears he won't listen to our prayers. And all of this, again, shows us these two things. Israel has failed to be a servant of the Lord. That they were supposed to live in obedience to God, which would shine as a, as a shining light, an example to the nations of what it meant to live as a people in covenant relationship with God. But they have failed. 
And so it is again abundantly clear that we need a different servant, a better servant. That servant, of course, is Jesus. Jesus is the suffering servant, as we saw last time in chapter 53, who will come to bring a new age of hope and comfort and righteousness and justice. But here's the second thing to grasp. For the people then and for us today, if that servant, Jesus, hasn't changed our lifestyle, then it's unlikely he's changed our destiny. If our faith in Jesus is so skin deep that no real change is happening, we ought to at least question, have we really trusted him at all? Now, please don't misunderstand. We are not saying that in order to have salvation, to be on the right side of God, we must earn it by good works. No, not at all. We, like Israel, fail at those good works. Rather, the change that ought to be evident in our lives is evidence that Jesus has rescued us. And if he has, we belong to God, well then we'll begin, not perfectly, but we'll begin to care about the things that God cares for. That's part of the evidence that we're saved by God, is that we, we are concerned for the things of God. So justice, for example... How can we work for it? The hungry, how can we care for them? The poor, how can we meet their needs? The refugee, how can we fend for them? Our family, how can we be there for them? And so on. More of that later. And that lesson comes through, verse 1, loud and clear, like a trumpet blast. Beware the danger of false, fake, skin-deep religion. By contrast, and I promise more briefly, here's number two. Embrace the blessing of true religion. Read on now, verse six. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free and break every yoke. So for Judah and for us, there is a better path. What is required? This true devotion to God. If you really know, if you really knew what it meant to be my rescued people, says the Lord, then you really would be changed. To truly know and love God is to love the things that he loves, to value the things he values. They need to leave behind their religious hypocrisy. It really was awful. Remember verse 4, they'd hold a fast, but it would end in a fight. Even their religious fasts became embroiled with their sort of selfish, bitter, violent disputes. There is a better path. But again, we need to be clear exactly how this maps onto our situation. As children of God in Jesus. Our obedience to God, if you hear nothing else today, hear this. Our obedience to God is two things. Firstly, as we've seen, it is evidence of our salvation. It doesn't earn us salvation. It is evidence of our salvation. But secondly, as a Christian, obeying God is the path to happiness and blessing. Remember that old hymn? It's, I was going to say it's kind of cheesy. I suppose that's a matter of taste. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Those words are so true. There's no contentment in, in living as a Christian who is in permanent rebellion, con constantly wandering from God. No, trust and obey. That's actually the way to blessing and happiness because this is God's good way to live. And so lastly this morning, number three, see, I told you number two would be short. Number three, lastly today, 
we're going to dig a bit more into the obedience required and the blessing experienced. Again, look at verse 6. This is the kind of obedience. To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, to break every yoke. So part of, not the whole picture, but part of living as a Christian means asking, where is there injustice around us? In our families? In our church? In our community? You know, it doesn't have to start with, like, take on the global systems. There's injustice all around us where we are. And by asking, what will we do to challenge it. God loves justice. Next, have a look at verse 7. We are to value generosity. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? So part of living as a Christian, not the whole picture, but part of it is saying, where is there poverty or lack around us? Again, you don't have to break the global system. You can start where you are, in your family, in our church, in our community. More than once in the last few years in the life of our church, Either I or our treasurer, Chris, have been asked to act as a kind of go-between, a sort of anonymous go-between from members of our church family knowing that other members of our church family were in financial need and wanting to support them. That is so encouraging to see. It is a sign of real Christian life. Where is their poverty? Where is their lack? What will we do to challenge it? God values generosity. We're also to put away malicious and accusing talk. Look at the end of verse 9. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, we all need to ask, has our speaking become sinful? Speech is, or can be, so destructive. Remember what the Apostle James says, James 3 verse 5, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. So, how is your speaking? How is your language? And especially, how are you speaking of others? Others in the church family? Others in your family? Others in our community? Next, we are to value Sabbath and Sabbath Rest, verse 13, if you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath, from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words. Our culture has entirely dispensed with the idea of Sabbath, with the Lord's day of rest. It once was a day not for shopping, not for working, apart from those who, of course, have no choice. But a day for resting, for refreshing, and a day set apart for the worship of God. What about us? What about us? This is a part, not the whole picture, but a part of what it means to follow the Lord. We've got to value the things that He values. And Sabbath rest is not a burden, says God, but a blessing. We could go on. 
But you see the point. When we express our faith in action in these ways, not only is that evidence of us truly belonging to the Lord, of us truly, to to use the gate, it's evidence that we have come in through the gate, that we have accepted Christ as our, our Savior. But it's not just that. This is also the way to experience the blessing of belonging to the Lord because God's word, here's the tragedy in Judah, God's word, his commands are actually good. They lead to blessing, not to burden. And walking in obedience with God is how we receive his blessing as well. And so finally, I promise finally, what blessing will we receive? What's it like to to walk in obedience with God and receive his blessing? What will happen? Firstly this, we'll shine with God's light. Look at verse 8. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. This is precisely what the nation of Israel had failed at. As they obeyed God, so they would shine as an example to the nations around them. God promises us that if we follow him, in faith and in obedience. The example of that will shine out to those around us who will, we hope, themselves come to see how good it is to walk with God. That, of course, is exactly the opposite of that lady I was speaking to who was so repelled away from Jesus and from the church by the hypocrisy she saw. So we'll shine with God's light. Secondly, we'll know God's presence. Verse 9, then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger of malicious talk. This is the very thing the nation wanted but wasn't getting. Because it was all just a religious sham. Walk in obedience with God. You will know the blessing of his presence in all you do. Next, we'll know God's guidance. Isn't this what we need? Look at verse 11, very short. The Lord will guide you always. Life is full of problems and confusions and difficult decisions? How often do we feel our need for some guidance? Maybe it's just me, but all the time. This is what it is. Again, to walk in obedience with God. He will be with you. You will shine for him. And he will guide you in all you do. And finally, we'll know true satisfaction. Verse 11, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. I love this image. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Again, isn't that what we want? I'm going to end today with a quote from a great author, David Jackman. He says this, summing up this whole passage, he says, covenant obedience, that is obeying God, is the channel of covenant blessing. Not as a meritorious work, in other words, not because it earns us God's favor, but as an appreciation of the rescuing grace of God having brought his people into relationship through the blood of the Passover, Yahweh prescribes how they can continue to live in fellowship with the God whose holy character the law expounds. It is all dependent on God's grace, which is limitless in its supply, so that there is no deficiency in God's provision. All the promised blessings really are available. That's what it is to know God by faith in Jesus and to walk with God 
in faithfulness to Jesus. Let's pray together, shall we? As we always do, let's take a moment of uh, quiet reflection to think on all the Lord has been saying to us today. Father God, we do confess that we, we find too much of ourselves reflected here in, in the lives of the people of Judah. Father, forgive us when our devotion is skin deep, when our religious activity is just that and no more. Father, thank you that in Jesus there is full and free forgiveness. We thank you that in your grace none of us is dependent on our works to know you. But Lord, we do pray for the work of your spirit in our hearts to trust in Christ as Savior and to walk with him as Lord. In his name we pray. Well, here's a very appropriate song to end with. I'm grateful to Ian who chooses our songs for us. This is a prayer that God would purify our hearts. So if you're able, let's stand as we sing. Pray that grace, mercy, and peace from God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would rest upon and remain with us always. Amen. Please do take a seat, and please do stick around for tea and coffee if you can.